one coming who would be the ultimate sacrifice. And every time we partake of the remembrance of your body and blood as we did this morning, God, we look back to that moment in time, that incredible moment where you offered your life for us. Father, may we ever be in awe of it. May we take that message and proclaim it to our world, Lord, in life and in word. So, God, as we go into your word, your holy scripture today, God, would you speak to us through it by the spirit that wrote it, through my lips and through our thought process, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. So take your scripture, however you have it, in written form or otherwise, And turn to Isaiah chapter 53. We have begun a new series. I think you have heard that. And if you haven't, we've begun a new series last week. We're calling Jesus B.C. To emphasize that long before Jesus was born as a baby on this earth, He was all over the Hebrew Scriptures. That the Old Testament is not old in terms of not talking about Jesus, but very much has Jesus. In fact, one of the books that David and I are referencing is called Jesus on Every Page. He's there. And week by week, beginning this week, we're going to take a portion of the Old Testament Scriptures and show how Jesus is clearly revealed and try to take the top ones or the ones at least that we thought that, that. there's no particular order we're going to go in, although this week we are going to begin with what I think arguably is the one that is the most obvious passage in the Bible of Jesus. I thought that as we began Isaiah 53, although you have all your versions open out there, I want to take you to a version that I look enjoy looking at every now and then. It's not the most scholarly version. It's not the version that I suggest for regular study and verse by verse, whatever. But it's called the easy to read version. This is a real version. This isn't one that I made up. This is one that's in print. It's actually called the ERV. <laughs> they gave it some letters. And it's, it's not a paraphrase. It's, it's an attempt at a translation, but they, they leave out the, propitia, the propitiation kind of words and just make them an easy, as if someone who's younger, who maybe doesn't have the vocabulary, like sometimes we feel like we don't. And it really is helpful to read it this way sometimes. So uh, let's read it in the easy-to-read version, Isaiah 53. You're going to read out loud, all right? Here we go. Ready? Go. Who really believed what we heard? Who saw in it the Lord's great power? He was always close to the Lord. He grew up like a young plant, like a root growing in dry ground. There was nothing special or impressive about the way he looked, nothing we could see that would cause us to like him. People made fun of him, and even his friends left him. He was a man who suffered a lot of pain and sickness. We treated him like someone of no importance, like someone people will not even look at but turn away from in disgust. The fact is, it was our suffering he took on himself. He bore our pain. But we thought that God was punishing him, that God was beating him for something he did. But he was being punished for what we did. He was crushed because of our guilt. He took the punishment we deserved, and this brought us peace. We were healed because of his pain. We had all wandered away like sheep. We had gone our own way, and yet the Lord put all our guilt on him. He was treated badly, but he never protested. He said nothing like a lamb being led away to be killed. He was like a sheep that makes no sound as its wool is being cut off. He never opened his mouth to defend himself. He was taken away by force and judged unfairly. The people of his time did not even notice that he was killed, but he was put to death for the sins of his people. He had done no wrong to anyone, He had never even told a lie. He was to be buried among the wicked, yet his tomb was with the rich. But the Lord was pleased with this humble servant who suffered such pain. Even after giving himself as an offering for sin, he will see his descendants and enjoy a long life. He will succeed in doing what the Lord wanted. 
after his suffering, he will see the light and he will be satisfied with what he experienced. The Lord says, my servant, who always does what is right, will make his people right with me. He will take away their sins. For this reason, I will treat him as one of my great people. I will give him the rewards of one who wins in battle, and he will share him with his powerful ones. I will do this because he gave his life for the people. He was considered a criminal, but the truth is, he carried away the sins of many. Now he will stand before me and speak for those who have sinned. Don't you find that easy? Simple sentences, not compound sentences. This is a version that I recommend for anyone who just struggles with the language of the Old Testament, the poetry. It's beautiful, I love it, but if they struggle with it or if they're really having a hard time getting into the Bible because it just doesn't make sense to them, it's hard to read, try the easy-to-read version. It costs about $20 or less on Amazon, and it would be a great way to, a great gift or a great thing for yourself to add to your library. That's all I'm going to say about that. But let's take a look at... Uh, at the background for how the New and the Old Testament, first of all, come together. Do you remember the story of Philip? He was one of the seven early deacons of the early church. It's in the book of Acts that we find his story in chapter 8. And in chapter 8, of, uh, you don't need to turn there, but you can look, read, it, read it if you want to. He is called by the Holy Spirit to minister to an Ethiopian official who was on his way back from Jerusalem where he was worshiping. And the Ethiopian was reading a passage out of Isaiah chapter 53, at least what we know is 53. There were no chapter divisions then. And he was not understanding what it was about. But he did perceive that it was not about a thing or not about a nation of Israel. It was about a person. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me of whom does the prophet say this? Who is he talking about? What person is he talking about? This official from Ethiopia was wise enough to realize that as he read this, this was not talking about a nation or talking about a thing or talking about some unsubstantiated object we don't know about, but that it was talking about someone. He was pierced through. He has done this for us. And then he asked this question, was Isaiah writing about himself? Because that was very, very often the, the case. The prophet was speaking of his own self or some other prophet in that day. Philip got up on the chariot, the story goes on, And it says, Philip opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture, what we know is Isaiah 53, he preached Jesus to him. So Philip knew by the Holy Spirit who this passage in Isaiah 53 is talking about. It's talking about Jesus. And the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch, received Jesus that day as his Savior. How do we know that? Because when they came to water, he said, here's some water, can I be baptized? And Philip baptized the Ethiopian, and he was saved that very day, believing that it was Jesus in Isaiah 53 that had given himself for his sins. So we know the New Testament says Isaiah 53 is about Jesus. Now let's look at Isaiah 53 for what it, for what it does say. And you can use your own version and see this. And when I, how I'm going to begin... Is, uh, is let's just go back one slide since you put that up there and I put it up there and just remind ourselves that there are two emphases of the, the Messianic prophecies. We said this last week in our introductory comments. I just want to review it. Both Luke, when he was writing about the road to Emmaus, has Jesus saying, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? I want you to circle in your mind and even in your Bible, if you would, the words sufferings and glory. Those are the two key emphases of the Messianic prophecies in the Jewish scriptures. The suffering of the Messiah and the glories to follow. And that order is important. And then it it is reaffirmed by Peter in the passage that I read as we opened our service. If you were here for that. The Spirit of Christ within them, the prophets, was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. And I emphasize sufferings and glory. So those are the two keys to the Messianic prophecies. And in Isaiah 53, we see clearly his sufferings, and we see a hint, 
though not specifically of his glories. But as we go on in Isaiah, you see very much of the glory to follow these sufferings. So that's an important thing to understand, the sufferings and the glory. So we can flip ahead two slides now. And I want to begin to show you a verse-by-verse outline. There's 12 verses in Isaiah 53. And I want you to compare these with your own scripture that you have. I think that's really critical. Verse number one says, and now I'm reading out of the New American Standard Version. Who has believed our message, says Isaiah, and by whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The arm of the Lord talks about the strength of the Lord, right? That's why the easy-to-read version said, who understands the strength of what God is doing? That's a question I have for you. That's a question Isaiah has for you. It's the question that God has for you. Who has believed our message of this suffering servant? Who has received it? Who has understood that this is God showing his mighty power Yes, as Jesus died on the cross as a a criminal, as his blood flowed, as he was withering away in, in life going to death, this is God's strength and power. Who would have guessed? Who would have known? C.S. Lewis made that pretty clear in his depiction of Aslan and and the magic of the of the table, if you know that story, that there was an amazing truth going on even as death occurred. So we see his call, and then Jesus in his life and death was. And I want you to write down these 11 words. You can write them right next, next to the verse or just write them down in your, in your thinking. First of all, verse 2 is going to teach us that Jesus in his life and death was humble. Look what it says. For he, this Messiah, this suffering servant, and we know him as Jesus, grew up before him. Who's the him? The God that asked the question. He grew up before him and before all of us, for that matter, as a tender shoot. Like a root out of parched ground. He had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He grew up in Bethlehem, a little tiny podunk village, at least at the time. He was in a manger in, 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 in a stable. He was a son of a carpenter doing menial work. They were poor. They only could offer uh, birds uh, for his and baptismal and dedication, and so on and so forth. So he grew up as a tender shoot. And a root out of parched ground, that has an interesting implication. When you see, like in a desert place, you see a little tiny plant coming out of the ground, you know something specifically about that plant. It's not getting its nourishment from the ground. It is totally self-sufficient in itself. Jesus got received no nourishment from this earth. He didn't need anything from us. He was a, an anomaly He was a stranger put into a strange land who was totally self-sufficient in and of himself, rooted in this place, but not drawing any sustenance from it. Isn't that an interesting picture? I thought it was. And here's Jesus, this tender little young boy, little baby growing up. He grew in wisdom and knowledge. He laid aside, the scriptures say in Philippians chapter 2, and he grew in wisdom and knowledge, said Luke in his description of him. He, he lay, laid aside the fact that he knew equal, E equals MC squared. And he had to learn that. Well, maybe he didn't learn that. I don't know. But he had to learn life and he had to grow. In, I mean, who, who would have thought that God would do that for us? He had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him. He was nobody special. If you passed him on the streets of, of, of Nazareth, you'd say, like as every other kid. He wasn't like this sparkling you know, halo around his head. Whoa, this eminence of God about him. He was just ordinary. In fact, maybe even a little less than ordinary because it goes on to say, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Nothing would have said, oh man, I want to date that guy if you were a girl. Or man, I want to play, have him play football on our t- Nothing. He was just an ordinary, probably average guy. Sometimes our artists have painted him as kind of this great-looking, blue-eyed Israeli, you know, with a kind of cocky smile. I don't think so. Because Isaiah says he was just an ordinary person. Now understand that Isaiah was writing this about someone that he had never met, didn't know, and he's writing as if Isaiah had already seen it and it had already happened. But Isaiah is writing it in the futuristic tense. That's what's really interesting about prophecy. He's writing it as if he knew it, as if he was outside of time. And after all, who's really writing Isaiah 53? The Spirit of God writing through Isaiah. So it's really the Spirit of God who is saying, we didn't see anything special about him looking down from heaven. He wasn't wasn't so special at all. We knew him in heaven. He was pretty cool then. But now he's pretty ordinary. Think of it in that perspective. Pretty amazing. So humility. 
In verse 3, we see he was rejected. It says he was despised and forsaken, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, like one from whom men hide their face. Oh, he was despised and we did not esteem him as anything special or ordinary. In fact, he was a bloody mess. He was just a carpenter's son. He didn't stand out. Not until all of a sudden he took on his ministry and began to do those amazing miracles and turn water to wine and heal the blind man and the, and the leper. So he was rejected, never esteemed for being God with us. Nobody thought that this was God. I bet even his mom and his dad wondered. They remember what the angel said and they treasured it in their heart, it says, but I'm sure they questioned it. Wouldn't you have earthly moms and dads? Is this really God here? You know, he looks pretty ordinary to me. He burps and he, you know, all that, you know. He was also, now we're going to look at three very important theological points in verses 4, 5, and 6. And these are key. Voluntary, substitutionary, and atoning. In fact, in our Oaks doctrinal statement, the paragraph that we say what we believe about Jesus, it says we believe in his voluntary, substitutionary, and atoning death. Critical doctrine. Now, I want you to explain what those are and see how they're revealed by the prophet through the Spirit in Isaiah 53. We see in verse 4, first of all, that it's voluntary. That means he was not a martyr. He was not a victim. He didn't have to die in the sense that men crucified him. The Jews did not kill him. Pilate did not take his life away from him. He gave his life willingly. It says in verse 4 of Isaiah, Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we thought, we esteemed him stricken of God and afflicted. We thought God or people or Pilate or the Jews were taking his life. No, he gave it. There's many other scriptures on this, but Isaiah 53 says it was a voluntary choice. He took the griefs upon himself. He took the sorrows upon himself. He chose to lay down his life. That's an extremely important doctrinal position. And then substitutionary in verse 5. He was pierced through for our transgressions. You can personalize that and say he died because of your sins. He was crushed for our iniquities. He died for your sins. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. We were made whole because he died in our place. And by his scourging, we are healed. Your healing spiritually is because he took the beatings that you and I deserved. Substitutionary death. He substituted for you. You deserve to die. I deserve to die. I deserve to be punished. You deserve to be punished. He took it upon himself. But more than that, and most important of all, is that it was an atoning death. Atonement literally means covering. The atonement is a covering. He covered our sins, but more than covering our sins, he disposed of them. He atoned them. In the New Testament, Paul makes it clear that that atonement is you know, wiped out. I like the old illustration of you know, the, the, uh, the housekeeper might, might uh, take the dust and sweep it under the carpet. It's atoned, but you can still see it. It's still there. Jesus swept it under the carpet and did a magic trick. And when you lift it up, it's not there anymore. He covered it, but it's gone. If that helps, so be it. That's how my silly mind works. But, but atoning, look at the atoning. In verse 6, it says, All we, like sheep, have gone astray. In other words, there's not one of us who hasn't sinned, who hasn't gone our own direction. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord, here it is, has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. It's in 2 Corinthians 5.21 in the New Testament that it says it the most clearly. He became sin for us. God called, caused him to become sin. Or or the doctrinal word is imputed. You don't see that in the easy to read version. Imputed, God imputed. In other words, he caused Jesus to be responsible for the, uh, the guilt and the wrong of your sin so that it was on him. No wonder at about noon 
On A.D. 33, I believe it was, the day that Jesus died, and he was on the cross for three hours, all of a sudden he called out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Using for the first time in his life, not my father, my father, not my, my dear, you know, eternal you know, friend, but this estranged word, my God, my God, nowhere before or after did Jesus ever call the Heavenly Father God. Did you know that? Only at that moment when I believe the sin of the world was on him and he immediately felt the loss of fellowship with the Father because he took your sin and my sin upon himself and there was the estrangement and loss of fellowship for that time. And he called, cried out in anguish, echoing the words of David that he had written in Psalm 22, if you remember. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So the atoning death of Christ. So there's a great three-point doctrinal statement of what Christ did for you. He voluntarily gave his life. He substitutionarily gave his life, and he atoned for your sin by taking your sin upon him. And that's a great message. We go on, though, in our, in our simple outline. In verse 7, he was accepting. He received it as God's will. He understood that this is what's supposed to happen. It wasn't like this took him by surprise. And so it says in verse 7, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He could have defended himself easily. He could have complained. He could have said, this is wrong, this is dumb. He could have, as the song says, called 10,000 angels and had them come down and wipe them all out. Could have done all that, but he didn't. Why? Because he understood that it was God's will, God's purpose, God's plan, that they had talked about as son and father back from the beginning of time. Remember, he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, if you remember that phrase. This had been talked about for long before we came along. And so he was like a lamb that is led to slaughter, a sheep that is silent. But as he's being sheared, he did not open his mouth. He kept silent. Why? Because this was supposed to happen. This was meant to happen. He could have stopped it, but he didn't want to. And God didn't want him to. So understand the importance of the accepting. He was misunderstood, wrongly judged, verse 8, just so we really understand that he had no reason to be on that cross. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who, cons- who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living? Who considered that he was doing this for the transgression of my people? Not one of those Jews, not, not Pilate, not anyone who's probably not even the disciples thought that he was actually dying for them at that moment. This is God's love. This is God showing his absolute incredible love as Jesus was dying and suffering on that cross. Who would have guessed that? Isaiah said this 600 some years before Jesus was born. Who would have considered that he was killed for the transgression of the people as he was dying there on the cross? And then he was, verse 9, honored, loved, victorious, and rewarded. The final third of the chapter, Isaiah 53, talks about the benefits. And this is where the hint of the glory of his resurrection comes in. It doesn't prophesy his resurrection here, but it certainly prophesies a coming back out of that terrible situation. In verse 9, he was honored with a rich man's grave. Did you know that he, like every other crucified criminal, was supposed to be thrown into a a mass grave? That's where they put all of the criminals on the Golgotha Hill. They would just take them down and cut them down, throw them in a big mass grave with a bunch of, you know, criminals. In other words, it says in verse 9, his grave was assigned with wicked men. That's where he was supposed to go. And frankly, that's where he should have gone, earthly speaking, and even spiritually speaking, because he had your sin and my sin upon him. He was a wicked, ugly person in the sight of God, having been had our sin put on him. In fact, it says in Ephesians that before he resurrected, which we know he did on the third day, where did he go? He went to hell. He first descended into the lower parts of the earth, not to be punished. (laughs) In fact, he ended up preaching to them down there, telling about his victory. I won. I won. You lost. (laughs) You know? But he went to hell. That's where you and I deserve to go apart from Jesus' sacrifice. That's how serious this is. That's how serious the message we give to our world is of how much they need Jesus. We're not just they're just not going to die and be annihilated. They're just going to die and say, oh, too bad I didn't make it to heaven. They're going to die and be punished. They're going to miss out on the glory of heaven. It is life and death stuff we're talking about here. 
His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death. Remember Joseph of Arimathea, a rich guy, had a private tomb. Who got a private tomb in those days? What carpenter? What rabbi? Got a private tomb right in, in near the city. That's Jesus. He had his own personal tomb, and he was taken there. And This was honor that God gave him in the midst of what he suffered. Why? Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. He had never lied. He had never done anything wrong. He was sinless. And so God honored him with a private tomb. But more important than that, verse 10, as we go on to see that he was loved by God, the Lord was pleased to crush him. Ooh, that kind of almost doesn't sound right, you know. God says, I am so pleased that he's being hurt and brought down and dying. Why? Because God so loved the world. He so loved you and me that he gave his son in this way. The Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would indeed render himself as a guilt offering, which he did, he, this Messiah, this Jesus, will see his offspring. He's going to see you and me in heaven. He's going to rejoice in what he did, what he accomplished. The good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. He's going to be rewarded. He's loved of God And you you see the hint of the resurrection? You see the fact he's going to come back, he's going to see this, he's going to be rewarded. Then we even get more of it in verse 11. He's victorious. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it, meaning see the day, see the people, see see his life beyond this, and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one will justify, the servant will justify the many. He will come back in victory, and we will praise him for eternity. And we will bow down, we will sing songs, and we'll say, holy, 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 and and glorious is this Lamb of God because He has done this for us. He'll be victorious in heaven. And then beyond that, He'll be rewarded. In verse 12, the final verse, therefore says God. Now God's talking at this point. It's interesting that right halfway through verse 11, Isaiah stops talking by the Spirit. And now all of a sudden God comes in and says, God says, by His knowledge, the righteous one, my servant. See, now God's talking. My servant will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I, the God of the universe, the the heavenly Father, will allot him, that is the Messiah, that is Jesus, a portion with the great. He will divide the booty with the strong. He has poured himself out to death. He was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. I am going to reward him big time in heaven forever. He's my boy. He's my son. He is God in flesh. And he's God in eternity forever. Now, I understand that I'm a New Testament pastor preaching this from a New Testament perspective. But can you imagine how difficult it would be to be a Jewish rabbi? By the way, I have an appointment to meet with one this month. You can pray for me. I'm going to meet with Rabbi Cohen, who seems to be a fine man, Steve Cohen. And he is the rabbi of the children of T.J. and Bill. You know, T.J. goes to our church and she hasn't really come for a long time because her husband is dying. I meet with him regularly. Went this last week, sang at Calvary and at the cross and blessed assurance to Bill. He enjoyed all three of them. We talked about what they meant and challenged him. But uh, Rabbi Cohen is representing the children who very much want a Jewish representation of Bill and T.J., his wife, wants a Christian representation of his life, and so it's going to be a Jew and a Christian sitting down together to see how can we do a service. It should be very interesting. Do you know how rabbis typically interpret this passage? They have to interpret it somehow, right? They don't believe it's a person. They don't believe it's the Messiah. I think the reason is if they thought it was the Messiah, how in the world can they miss Jesus as being the Messiah? But their typical translation is, do you know what it is? It's the nation Israel. And you say, what? Really? Even the Ethiopian official didn't think it was a thing. He thought it was a... But they believe that when it says, he grew up before him like a tender shoot, he's talking about the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was a root out of parched ground. The nation of Israel had no stately form that we should look upon him, talking about him as a person. Or, or, or. He, the nation, was despised and forsaken and a man of sorrows. Surely our griefs he himself, the nation of Israel, bore... And his sorrows the nation carried upon him, and he was pierced through, and we like sheep have gone astray, but he was like one who didn't open his mouth or complain. You ever heard a Jew not complain? Uh, anyway, not, that's, that's neither here nor there. I had to throw that in, I'm sorry. 
they really have to force it, is what I'm saying, because they can't believe that it's Jesus. They've been blinded, I believe, in my opinion. But it's a person, as the Ethiopian thought, as Isaiah, it wasn't Isaiah, it was a person. And isn't it thrilling that we see this? Let me just give some final applications just to leave with you. I know our time is running, but I, this won't take long. But I, I, it's always important not only to revel in what it says, but to say, what is my application? First of all, I must believe this report and receive this power from the Lord. Isaiah says, who has? Who has? Will you, in other words? Have you received? Have you put in your heart for, and put that stake in the ground and saying, this is my Jesus, my Messiah. His death for me was voluntary, substitutionary, and atoning. I receive Him as my Savior because without it, I'm dead meat when it comes to eternity. John quotes from Isaiah 53 when he says, But though He had performed so many signs before them, speaking of Jesus, yet they were not believing in Him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet in chapter 53, which he, when he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So John quotes saying, people are not receiving him, and you don't want to be like that. Don't let it be your legacy that you haven't believed the report, and you haven't accepted and received the power. Second application from verses 2 and three, I put up there just some thoughts, and I'm just going to read them just for the sake of time and for you to reflect on these. Just as he was fragile, dependent, and often needy, which is what Isaiah reports, we must accept that this will often be our lot in life as well. How easy it is for us to complain and to say, why, why, is I, why am I the children of God? Why am I so dejected? Why am I so needy? Why am I so dependent? Why am I so fragile? Why are things not going so well for me? You know why? Because we're to share in the sufferings of Jesus. We're to realize that He had nothing better than we have. In fact, He had it worse. In our need and suffering, may we identify with and share in the sufferings of Christ. Just as He laid aside His right to greatness, may we lay aside our need for greatness and humble ourselves to be God's servant for the sake of others. Can we not learn humility and laying down ourselves as He did? Do we need to seek that extra you know, star? Do we need to get that extra point? Do we need to be honored? Jesus didn't. That doesn't mean you don't do your best. That doesn't mean you don't work hard. It just means you don't need it. I'm okay. Philippians 2 says, Although he existed in the form of God, he didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. We're to empty ourselves, folks. We're to empty ourselves of our need to be great, and we are to take the form of a bondservant and not be something that we're not supposed to be anyway. And then 1 Corinthians 6.19 reminds us that do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? You don't own yourself. You are not about you. It's God owns your body. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And so like Jesus, may we humble ourselves. The next application from verses 4, 5, and 6, and I mentioned this pretty clearly. I must affirm and teach this trifold truth of the voluntary, substitutionary, and atoning death of Jesus. Any other assessment is heresy and is not the gospel into salvation. When you have to leave Oaks, may it never be, when you have to leave Oaks, if you do, would you check doctrinally where they stand on the voluntary, substitutionary and atoning death of Jesus Christ, you cannot believe how many Christian churches don't affirm that. Not to affirm that is heresy, and it's not the gospel. I must respond as eternally grateful. I don't live in guilt or condemnation. How many of us still live that way? But in freedom and victory, because he's taken it away, I look under the carpet of my life and there's, there's no sin. There's no dirt. It's not there. I'm victorious. I live to honor his sacrifice in a life given back to him. And then the application from verses 7 and on and 8. Like Jesus, when we are doing the right thing, we don't need to complain or defend ourselves. How often have I tried to defend myself? And it just sounds shallow. Thou protesteth too much, said Shakespeare. Remember that phrase? Jesus didn't. 
Why? Because he knew he was doing the right thing. When we're doing the right thing and the right path, don't complain, don't defend, just live your life. We simply do it with God's pleasure as our reward. And as we can help others to know that Jesus was willing to lay down his life for us, we should now do the same for him. You remember, of course, Paul's challenge to us in, in Romans 12, 1. I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Just live your life for Him and let that be your testimony. Don't be a complainer. Don't be a whiner. Don't be a defender of who you are. Just live your life for Him. Final application that I want to give you from the final verses of 9, 10, 11, and 12. Just as Jesus was honored by the Father for His willing sacrifice and righteous life, So we can be assured of the same. God's going to honor you too. Now, he's not going to make you the chief uh, head of heaven, by the way, as he did Jesus. But he's going to honor your life too. We have that all over the the Revelation letter. So we can be assured of the same, measured to what we deserve, of course. And our chief motivation will not be the reward, though we'll receive it, but to serve the God we love. And we can help others to know how beautifully Isaiah 53 shouts does it not, of Jesus. I think this is the number one passage in the Old Testament that speaks of Jesus. Jesus B.C., very well alive, 600 B.C. when Isaiah wrote it. Hope that helps you understand that chapter a little bit better, gives you an outline of it, gives you an application for it. I'm going to ask our team to come back, and I want to just sing a couple of brief songs that will definitely bring this to life as we finish, okay? And as, as you sing these songs, just want to challenge you, Reflect on Isaiah 53, because these songs help you to do that. Reflect on maybe some aspects of it you didn't realize, maybe some aspects you need to share with other people. And if there's anyone here today that has not made a commitment to that Jesus or has been wandering like those sheep that the chapter talks about, there are those up here that would love to pray with you. David's going to be one. There's going to be someone over here soon. And you can come up and just pray with them and talk with them during the service. (laughs) 